You know, just like physical illness, mental illness can be overcome. We just got to inspire people to believe that. The mental health community and the firearms industry spent way too much time running parallel to each other without communicating. It's time we change the narrative and destroy the stigma that we both face. Walk the Talk America presents Guns and Mental Health, a podcast for firearms owners, clinicians, and the curious public. The drum intro is my favorite. We just we just drop the sound a little bit and then we talk over the rest. How's everybody? Good. I don't think I've ever done a podcast where they like intro <laughs> played like that. We don't do it very often because it's sort of distracting when you use the board to do it. Usually I add it in afterward, but um, sometimes it's fun. We actually went into this one kind of nice and smooth. Usually we're very clunky. Well, we yeah. spent the last 39 minutes being clunky before we started recording this time. <laughs> Hey, everybody who's curious, uh, you know, if you're joining us for the first time, my name is Jake Wiskirch, and I'm joined by Mike Sedini. We host the show, and our guest is Ashley Lubinsky. Hello, Ashley. Hello. And uh, if they didn't read your bio on the uh, post or on the show notes, maybe you could introduce yourself and tell us uh, who you are and what you do and where you live and all that good stuff. I always feel like that's such a complicated question. All right. Give your verbal but, resume now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who am I? Uh, I'm Ashley Levinsky, and I am a firearms historian and consultant. I used to run the Cody Firearms Museum, which is one of the largest gun museums in the country. And now I work for all sorts of museums that have firearms collections, related collections, uh, artifacts associated with cultural trauma and violence and crime. And uh, on top of that, I do expert witness testimony because sometimes people think historians should talk in a court of law. It's a questionable thing. And I do a lot of television producing on camera at firearms history. So basically if it's firearms history related, I do it. It's pretty cool. We've, uh, we've had a number of people on the show who are really, really good at what they do and they're really super well known. I don't know that we've ever had an actual court appointed expert can you think of anybody who might have fallen in that category, Mike? No, actually. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So you're you're in a, a rare company, I guess, and uh, and you're a, you're a female. You know, chick, chicks are chicks oh, yeah. are fun. Chicks are fun with firearms. <laughs> chicks with firearms are fun, um, but not just because you know it's punchy and cute and it's a small demographic, but because you represent such a a broad swath of knowledge and a very niche. Um, I guess you could call it a market um, because you do get paid to do what you do when you give this testimony and you consult on these projects and so forth. So um, I think that's really cool. And uh, when you and I were chatting a couple of weeks ago, just kind of about comparing notes and how we might be able to help each other and so forth. I was, uh, I was giddy. I was, I was like, man, there's so many questions I want to ask. And uh, this podcast might be that opportunity to ask some of those, but uh, I guess maybe we should start off by, you know, sharing with everybody how we connected like how did you find us and and all that through cheryl and and how did this kind of just organically present itself because i think that's a neat story in and of itself well i actually i've known about you guys for a while so i've been you know a, a fan <laughs> i guess and i i I come kind of tangential to the firearms industry. I always say I'm not quite in it because as a historian, I tend to be critical of everyone. <laughs> it's just what we do. Um, but I, I'm always fascinated by different companies, organizations that kind of bridge the gap between the gun world and not the gun world, because that's a lot of what I do. And I started studying in graduate school uh, firearms and perception. So the way that we perceive them within culture, uh, the way that they've historically been involved and kind of how we got to the debate that we have today. And a lot of that research uh, ended up being about collective memory and nation building in the post-Civil War period. And so while I am a historian and not a psychologist, uh, although I almost became one, I am always fascinated by kind of the, the link between you know, psychology and understanding how people think, how people perceive, how people understand, and the actual history behind it. That is an excellent tee up. Go ahead, Mike. 
You're no, welcome. I was gonna, I was going to say like one of the things when, when we were chatting before you came on, Jake, before the show, and we're sitting in the open room, I never even thought about from the you know firearms from the aspect of in a museum, right? And I just assume like most of your clientele are people that come through the museum and they just want to see some cool firearms or things like that. And you're like, we have people come over all over the world. Most of them don't even know anything about firearms. Right. Yeah. And that, that plays right into what you just said. Well, and it's, it's been fascinating to me because I didn't grow up around guns. So I started studying firearms in college for the first time. I had never held a gun before I was 18 years old. And so I always felt like I came into the world understanding where kind of everyone was coming from. So I've never been super critical of people who you know don't like firearms or don't understand them because I find more often I deal with people who say things or understand things out of ignorance, you know, not knowing the subject matter rather than coming at it from an intentional malice. I deal a lot with the media and that's, I've always had more positive experiences than a lot of people have in the media because I understand why people don't understand it. And I was always kind of interested in finding that happy medium for people. And so when I was brought out to Wyoming, it was a little difficult because I worked in DC before I, I moved to Wyoming. And while I too am a firearms enthusiast and you know geek out over the thousands of guns that were in that are in the Cody Firearms Museum collection, I very much wanted to focus on the people that knew nothing about it. You know, since we do have, you know, half of our audience comes to a larger organization that we're a part of. They, this may be their only opportunity to see firearms or understand firearms. And I wanted to create a space for them so that they could ask questions without feeling like they were being judged so that I could facilitate dialogue with gun people and non-gun people. And you basically provide them with an overview so that they can leave the museum and form their own opinions about how they feel about firearms moving forward. And if that's an opinion, they still don't like them, but they can make that informed decision, then that's fine. Um, so when we created the museum, it was very much trying to merge the two audiences and being a place that people could come in and gain an understanding and not come in and have an understanding that's assumed uh, to exist. That's a great synthesis, I think, of what we do or what we're trying to do is, and I could broadly lump it under the umbrella of education. I think a lot of people think of education in the traditional sense of teacher at the front of the classroom dispensing knowledge to the awaiting vessels or whatever. And, and it's not always that way. Sometimes education, and I think probably more often, education is experiential and it's unintentional. And you, what you're doing with museum presentations, what we're trying to do with our programming is intentionally educate people um, who may be curious, humble, um, aware of their own blind spots and want to solve that problem in a, in a non-threatening way, right? There's, there's no agenda here. The agenda I mean, I guess there is an agenda. The agenda is to teach, um, and, you know, and that's our bias. We want we want to get information out, and certainly our expectation at the end. And I, I mean, I don't know you super well, but I could be comfortable enough to say that I think if you had a desired outcome, it would be people leave with more knowledge than they entered, right? Yeah. Well, and from the the flip side, the, a lot of people who are super into firearms, you know, come in and they know all the markings and all the variations on you know Winchester Model seventy they sometimes don't understand kind of the overarching picture. You know, they get so focused in on the guns themselves that they don't necessarily think about the larger dialogues, their larger impact on industry, society, and culture. And so when we built it, you know, we obviously thought about them as well, that there is a lot that can be, you know, learned on the other side, even when you think that you have that knowledge already. And as in my studies, you know, I always, my answer to every question about anything in firearms history is it's complicated. And because there's so much, and I'm sure you guys know that there's so much more to understand and you'll never know everything. And if you think you know everything when you come into the museum, which we get a lot of those people, you know, you, <laughs> you, you tend to kind of hit a wall uh, and realize that this is a much bigger story. It's 700 years of history um, and that it can be interpreted in so many different ways. And facts aren't always just facts. You know, it's something I hear a lot of. You can't argue with facts. Well, the entire historical academic field is arguing about facts. Uh, and so it, it's, you know, providing that information that we do know, you know, when things were invented, when things were patented, you know, when things changed, but then allowing people to be able to look at all of that and, and make their own conclusions based on where they're coming from. 
Yeah, let's dive in a little bit to that uh, that history and that culture because we we run a cultural cor course. It's a it's to designed to enhance the cultural competency, primarily of clinicians about firearms because that was the direction we leaned initially. But the flip side of that coin is to enhance the culture of counseling to people who need it, and that can be firearms owners, and typically that's where we we lie with our uh, targeted audience. But it also extends to people who just have misunderstandings about what therapy entails, right? So. From your perspective, when we're talking about firearms culture, the history, the things you rattled off in the beginning, like, you know, nation building post-Civil War, I'd really like to, you know, rewind to that and have you kind of give your your spiel about some things that you see, some common elements, maybe some some thematic presentations that emerge over time that you've seen through the literature and through your studies that are relevant today. So if I'm listening, if I'm a listening person to this show, um, what would you like to impart to me that helps explain some of the the tensions and the frictions and and the dialogues and the debates that are going on these days well the post-civil war period is always it's kind of where i start in a lot of my you know lectures and speaking engagements when i talk about perception and that's because our culture in america changes so much after the civil war and there's a lot you know of interpretation with people going out west but basically after the civil war there are so many different things going on you know you have a fractured country and people coming out of a very significant you know trauma uh, as a result of the war and as a result of all the loss. And so people are trying to make sense of how to reunify the country. And I think to some extent, the West becomes that unification. I mean, obviously, that's not everybody's included in that story. And that story is, you know, very damaging to a lot of people that were actually out in the West. But it's almost like that Western identity, which still to this day, people associate with America, especially people abroad, um, that almost becomes that, that linchpin for uh, Americans to be able to figure out who they are. At the same time, though, that they're trying to grapple with this, firearms become a lot more available. You know, prior to the Civil War, you're moving through the concept of mass manufacture, you're getting a lot more firearms being produced and, and production being ramped up during the war. Uh, and then when the war ends, you've got all of this post-war weapon surplus, where for a few dollars, you could buy a gun that was made for the war. Uh, if you're a soldier for $6, you could buy your own gun uh, and take it with you. And so there's a lot of inexpensive mass-produced firearms that are available. And during this time period, you also start getting the you know, major manufacturer names like Winchester pop up, and they're producing things that are used for a variety of reasons. So in the colonial period, you might have had your long rifle, and your long rifle was used for hunting, it was used for defense, it could be used in a very specific military manner, but then it's also used for target shooting. So it's kind of like you know, your multi-purpose tool. But by the time you get into the post-Civil War period, there's such a quantity, there's such a diversity in product that now you see people owning you know, lots of firearms and you see them owning them for different reasons. And coming into that, you also get the modern consumer culture by the turn of the 20th century. And so you start seeing marketing and ads towards specific type of people. At the same time, <laughs> there's so much that goes on here. You've got all that stuff going on in a practical sense, but then you also have firearms becoming metaphor and symbol in our culture a, a lot more than you see it before. So you see, hear a lot of people say, you know, guns are tools, guns are tools. Well, they're a lot more than that. And especially when you look at art, uh, photography depicting the battlefield where firearms, you know, are repositioned on people that have have been killed in battle. You know, those photographs exist. And then firearms are used in art, whether they're used to, to glamorize the situation like the American Western myth or whether they're used, you know, as a very, you know, as a very intense, um, you know, sad symbol. You see that a lot as well. During this time period, Chekhov's gun, the uh, you never leave a loaded gun on the stage unless you intend to use it, comes about in theater. Um, theater moves on and starts using firearms. And then, you know, ultimately it becomes a part of our language by the turn of the 20th century. When you look at photography as it advances, point, shoot, all of that was, you know, gun terminology that becomes a part of not just, you know, our language, but really everything. So you've got guns being made, marketed, and a new consumer culture. And then you also have guns being used as metaphor and symbol uh, a lot more. And so it becomes 
almost more than what it was before. And that continues to evolve into what we have today. Um, and I've been talking for a long time, so I will not, I will say this, but then I won't talk about it unless you guys want me to, which is that uh, legislation around firearms also significantly changes in this time period, um, especially coming into the early 20th century, which impacts a lot of this as well. Yeah, you're, what you're alluding to there is something in, uh, in the psychological world we would call an archetype uh, that comes from Carl Jung primarily. But uh, it's, it's this idea that regardless of culture, origin, um, you know, even, even geographic location, human beings will have an understanding of something. And some of those archetypes are the hero, the wise old man, the nurturing mother. And we don't often think in terms of, I think there's a creation archetype as well. But we don't necessarily think of it in terms of like firearms. Um, one, one archetype that re recently graced my consciousness was the idea of uh, Western medicine. We've, it's been around so long now, it's transcended so many generations that now we just have this ongoing assumption that if you get sick, you're going to get healed. Someone out there has the, the cure, the medicine or the treatment, right? And, uh, and then that leads into this idea that you're not allowed to die. So every death is tragic. And we've lost touch with the idea of death as a part of life. That's one archetype. And, and what I'm hearing is this archetype of firearms 700 years, you know, or like you, like you mentioned, is a very long time to have something pervading culture. And it, I don't know where to go with this line of questioning. There's so much I want to ask, uh, uh, but I wanted to t at least pause and reflect on that. When we think about archetypes, they're not something we can get away with, uh, from uh, unless we go through yet more generations in a different direction that then somehow overrides or smothers or replaces the, the, the current archetype. And so that was, I don't know, it was just, it just struck me when you were talking, that's, it's pretty, it's so pervasive. I would submit that it's probably embedded into our psyches. Yeah. Well, and I always tell people when I'm educating in the museum world or, you know, in, at a university is that pretty much uh, you can give me any subject in history and I can probably tie it back to firearms or firearms related items in some way, shape or form. Uh, but you, you, met, you mentioned archetypes and I think that's interesting because the firearms world also tends to market to those, you know, different areas of things that we Absolutely. know. About. When you look at that time period, you know, you've got the the woman that's the, you know, basically the person that every man would want because she's a great target shooter, but then you also have the protective mother and all of those images, which still continue today. Uh, and in some ways they're still thriving and in other ways they're, you know, considered very negative uh, in terms of approach. But it's interesting because, you know, the gun world does that. And then I think, like you said, to some extent, guns become that as well. When you look at assumptions about, you know, the West, well, you think Winchester and Colt. Uh, you don't think that Winchester actually made their money in ammunition and were far more of a military superpower in World War I um, and World War II than, you know, the lever action. So you get a lot of that, you know, association and assumption, which comes across many different things, including marketing and pop culture. But, you know, it's, it's far more complicated underneath the surface of that. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I, um, <laughs> Again, there's there's a lot to cover, and I think it's more suited for you know maybe uh, cocktails around the campfire. But <laughs> one thing I want to ask though is, as we're dealing with um, you know the the ongoing research, we're very involved. Walk Talk America is involved with a lot of people who are researching so-called gun violence, and we can debate the, the the term. But but the point is when when acts are perpetrated either purposely or unintentionally with firearms, and harm befalls another human being, we can loosely call it violence. We're a suicide prevention organization at our core, but it doesn't mean we don't want to involve ourselves in preventing negligent discharges and irresponsible, you know, uh, possession and so forth. How are you seeing the historical application of of modern dialogue? Like, this, is that a thing, or like, is this what you're called into the courtroom to do? Uh, the television shows, like, uh, what what's the connection here? A couple of different things um, in terms of the courtroom. My main function, I guess, in terms of Second Amendment cases specifically, because I do product liability and I've done some criminal cases uh, for the Canadian government. Um, but in terms of what I get brought on in, in Second Amendment cases is the fact that in modern, and I'm no legal scholar, let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you that, but my understanding is um, in modern legislation, a lot of the times the rationale for why something is done is completely 
faulty if you actually know the history. And so one of the arguments that gets brought up a lot is I think it's the loophole in the Heller decision um, where something can be regulated if it's considered not in common use or unusually dangerous. And so when you look at assault weapons bans, and I, I, you know, I'm an expert on the California case. And when you look at assault weapons ban, that's the, the argument that's being made is that these features on this firearm are unusual, um, that makes them dangerous and that they're not in common use. So in that case specifically, my job was, you know, I don't take a side. My job was basically to go through every feature that's listed by, you know, by the California definition, um, as well as the historic definition and identify the historical origins of that. Um, you know, so pistol, pistol grips have been around since the 1700s. Um, and, you know, folding stocks have been around since the 1600s and magazine fed firearms the 1600s. And my purpose in a lot of that, and when I was in deposition for the state, and I recently testified in front of the Senate was, I don't care what your position is, but if you are saying you are doing this for X reasons or you're telling your constituency or whomever that you're doing something in order to accomplish it, I want you to have as much information as possible because if you're built on faulty logic, then it's going to get overturned or it's going to get challenged. And you know, if you genuinely believe that those are the things you wanna see on either side of the spectrum and that's not what you're doing, you know, whether you're ignorant or you're doing it intentionally, I think you know, I just try to provide enough of a background for people to be able to, again, make more informed decisions. And if their decisions are, I'm going to ignore all of that <laughs> and push forward, then that's, you know, then that's their right to do that. And that's not my place to tell them how to feel, but that's where history comes into play a lot in that. And then the other side of that is you look at a lot of modern rhetoric and modern rhetoric typically comes out of different time periods. The one I talk about a lot is the post, uh, post-World War II period during armed feminism. There was, a, there was a whole subset of the second wave of feminism that was armed. It was super, super radical, like more radical than the second wave of feminists that become the third wave. And all of their everything that they say, everything that they, you know, preach and educate sounds exactly like the 1990s refused to be a victim program from the NRA. So a lot of those talking points that, you know, people debate back and forth today have a historical origin. And what I love and find fascinating is oftentimes the historical origin is the person you're arguing with right now. So, you know, feminists now often are not associated with firearms, often don't like firearms. And then you see women who arm themselves often don't like feminists. And it's ironic that they have each other to thank for their arguments and where they are today. And so that's where I think the rhetoric gets really fascinating. There's a similarity in what we do in counseling with regard to helping people point out or helping to point out in people their behavioral patterns, belief systems, et cetera, that, uh, aren't working for him. And that's what brought him into the office. Right. So, um, my question to you is, cause it sounds like you may have a similar frustration. I don't know how you let go of this. So maybe you're coaching me as well. When are you comfortable dispensing the information and then t- stepping back and saying, do with it as you please without needing to, Oh, wait, are, are you really sure? Are you really sure you want to ignore what I'm saying to you? Cause you know, we watch people make decisions in the counseling world all the time that don't benefit their self-interest, maybe even go in opposite direction of the treatment plan. But at some point we got to be comfortable honoring their autonomy and saying, Hey, I've done what I can to help illuminate your position. And if you're continuing to choose this other thing, that's, that's on you at this point. How, How do you make peace with that? And when do you know enough is enough? Well, first I always say, I don't talk to people who are angry or emotional because I just, you know, there's a, there's a place for emotion, but in what I do, you know, it's very much, you know, not tied to emotion. Um, And so when people are upset or angry or, you know, in general, emotional, they, they're not going to hear it. And it's not the time to have that conversation. Honestly, I, I do get frustrated um, by both sides. I mean, I actually get really frustrated with the gun world because I feel like, you know, the gun world eats their own so often and, you know, can, and both sides can be really hypocritical in, in what they say. They may support, you know, the gun people may support guns and then they start associating, you know, abortion with, you know, firearms or religion with firearms. And then the other side, you know, tends to do the same just in other areas. And so I don't like when it all gets tied together. Um, I think it should be separate things. Um, But for me, it's, I just walk away from it. I can't fix it. 
I can just provide as much information and I can encourage you know, people to also start studying this because it's not a widely studied area and hope that down the road, you know, people hear it. And I, I know for a fact that I've had a lot of positive impact on people that really don't like firearms um, that come to, they purposely come to me to ask their questions. And so for me, it's just telling as many people as possible and hoping it sticks with somebody, but I don't, I worry more about when we eat our own than, you know, the people listening to me. <laughs> Have you ever had an instance, especially when you're in a court case where you're drawing on a particular aspect of a firearm in, in history and thought, well, this is, this could go against what a typical 2A person would say that's supposed to be, you know what I mean? Like, have you ever, you've seen it come close? Oh. You're kind of like, yeah. Happens all, I mean, it does happen all the time. Uh, in terms of history, I mentioned facts, you know, aren't always just facts that are non-negotiable. And I have plenty of colleagues that know all the same facts as me and conclude very differently. Um, so I encounter that a lot. The one thing though, that I say with uh, the features and all of the different things that I've encountered is that it's not necessarily on the side of 2A um, and all of that kind of culture, but in terms of the legislation and the legislation that's being proposed or already enacted, the evidence of the firearms technology in and of itself tends to be on the side of the people who are suing uh, the people who made the legislation or the people who are challenging the people who made the legislation. And part of that is because the people who make the legislation don't actually know the information well enough to make that decision. Um, and that's not necessarily their fault either because there's not a good resource or database for them to find it. And if they have researchers, which they do, who provide the information and those researchers have nothing to go on um, except for politically you know, charged you know, different organizations, then they don't know how to cherry pick what's right and what's not. So typically the gun features, the history behind those and those gun related um, and feature oriented legislation tends to be on the side of people uh, who understand the technology. And then in general, you know, you can have the facts and see them totally differently. And I just see that all the time. Um, I personally don't take a case that I don't believe in. Um, you know, so if, you know, someone were to come to me and say, I want this conclusion out of this history, I'm not going to be involved in it at all. So I tend to try to stay as ignorant as possible of the case at large, other than the, you know, the interest, you know, the key points for my testimony, I try not to get involved in the fights and the personalities of everyone so that I can make it as unbiased as possible. Do you find yourself um, being pulled in certain directions more often than you are invited to just simply present what you know? I don't think pulled in certain directions. I think I get put into boxes more than get pulled into the direction. So um, on my social media, you know, when I post about something that I've done or some history, if you read what I say very carefully, you know, you can tell that I'm really trying to be fair to everybody. Um, you know, sometimes I'm not, but <laughs> that's just human nature. But I, if you actually read what I say, I'm very careful in the way that I word it so that I'm, you know, trying to provide just, you know, the information and my interpretation of that. But then you'll see the comments and, you know, people assume a lot about, you know, what that means that I believe in in other things and other respects. And I always find that fascinating. So I don't feel like people pull me to be something I don't want to be, but I feel like based on the things that come out of my mouth and the things that people hear <laughs> that come out of my mouth, I get pulled into other categories of, you know, personality traits and political beliefs and religious beliefs. And the reality is, is that I think if either side knew how I felt about different things, they'd probably both be pissed at me. Yeah, we see that quite frequently. And you're, you're speaking about a concept called projection. When people throw onto us what they need us to be based on what they've already determined in their minds is real or whatever their, their version of reality is, then we get lumped into those boxes or those categories, right? We get labeled and it's really hard to remove a label from someone or something or an event once you've, you've placed it there. And so it's, it, it can be incredibly frustrating when you make a statement that you believe is neutral, balanced and fair, but because it doesn't fit somebody's preconceived notion, you end up catching flack for it. I, I get that all the time. I know Mike, Mike gets it probably more often than I do uh, because people from certain angles need him or me or you to be 
what they want us to be rather than just be staying neutral. This is what, by the way, why I'm such a big fan of emotional functioning. If you know your emotions and you know when they're starting to flare up and cloud, whatever your information is that you're trying to convey, uh, you can moderate your communication and improve it so that you can be heard, right? And that's really the point is to be heard, not to get into a screaming match and, and dig trenches. Um, Mike, do you want to say something there? Look, you're leaning in. Oh, no, no, no. This is fine. I love when you talk about emotional functioning. <laughs> well, you know what was interesting was when I, uh, when the California case was overturned and now it's, you know, state and all that stuff. Which, which one are you uh, talking about there? Just so we're clear. The assault weapons ban case. Uh, sorry, I worked on a bunch. Of, I'm still working on some cases over there, but the assault weapons ban when it was overturned by federal judge Benitez. Um, and now that's you know back in the court system, which is not surprising, but I made a post about it and I got death threats from both sides, uh, <laughs> which I, you know, I guess you're doing your job right when that happens. When everyone hates you. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, they think the most interesting, you know, thing that told me I was doing the right thing was that I had people who are friends of mine on social media that really hate firearms, um, you know, and they support the assault weapons ban and all that stuff. They came pretty hard after certain people being like, no, 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 like I don't like guns. And what Ashley's doing, you know, is super helpful for us to understand because what I told, what I tell all my friends that hate guns is if you you know, want to see firearms regulated, then you should be really pissed off by the laws that are being passed because they're not doing what they say they do. And right. if you genuinely believe that that is the right way to go, you know, you're being lied to because that's not what is actually happening. So I was really proud of myself when some of my anti-gun friends chime up in support of me uh, by other anti-gun people or other pro-gun people. I think that's pretty great um, because the comments can always get weird, but. Yeah, it's, it, it's one of those things. I, I think I take more heat from gun people because they don't want to understand what I do. It's hard for them to wrap their head around it. They just think, you know, they hear suicide and firearm and there's like, stop blaming the gun. It's like a natural reaction. It's very frustrating to take crap from somebody that maybe has sold 20 guns to their friends. You know, I think about all the people I've armed and selling 60 to 80,000 yeah. guns annually. It's like, I'm the last person that you're going to call anti 2A. But, you know, it is kind of interesting the way firearms people are so bowed up and ready to fight and argue that sometimes they don't even look around. They just hit the next person next to them. And that person could be more two way than them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so true. Well, and the other side of that, which Jake and I talked about, which ultimately got me, you know, to talking to you guys is the fact that gun people are so strong on, you know, stop blaming the gun, stop blaming the gun. And the guns are diverse and, you know, far more complicated than all of that. And then you turn it on, well, it's mental illness. And like, if you, I don't understand how, if you can see how complicated, you know, firearms are and their technology are, and that, you know, there's nuance there and how you can turn and say, you know, it's mental illness and not realize that there's nuance and diversity within that. And that's, that gets me super frustrated. <laughs> um, and is why I reached out to you guys in the first place. Cause it just, I don't understand how we can understand nuance on one side and then totally disregard it on the other. Yeah, it's one. Of the, it's something I posted recently on Twitter. Actually, I, I said something to the effect of, "If you believe that your position has nuance, then you probably would do well to understand that the position you're teeing off on also has the same nuance." So we would we would do very well to acknowledge when we're being monolithic in our approach, uh, and extend the same courtesy and, and grace to the other side or sides that we don't see, you know, it's, it's again, back to the labels. It's very easy to put something in a box and then pretend that you know everything about it. Cause then it becomes your punching bag. The problem is that it's never that way. And back to this historical analysis, I guess has through your study, have, have you seen it always be this contentious or is there periods in time that we're like, are we in a period of time that's unique separate from the rest where people are so dug in and unwilling to receive new information. And this isn't everybody. I mean, I think most people live in the middle somewhere where they're like, yeah, I can see that point. That's, that's reasonable. It's only on like social media that we end up being hyperbolic, but it, I mean, has there always been this, this struggle, this back and forth? No, <laughs> oh, simple okay. answer. No. Um, I would say a lot of that contention really grows out of the post-World War II period. Um, it's, you know, it's a violent time in American history. It's a time of, you know, revolutionary change. 
the technology changes in and of itself. They go from being wood and steel to polymers and experimentations and you know materials that are ultimately being used by aeronautics companies. I mean, the AR-15 was originally Armalite, which was a subsidiary of Fairchild. So the face of firearms is changing, but then it's also, there's so much going on in American culture and people are trying to make sense of it, you know, and there's just radicalism everywhere and firearms becomes more to people and, and the people who want to see the violence stop, they, you know, they write all about it during that time period. There's a lot of debate about firearms and gun culture. A lot of academics look at gun culture specifically in that time period because they start breaking down hunting culture and sport culture and this defense culture and how the defense culture can be linked with violence. And so I see the modern era really starting in the 60s and 70s, uh, especially, especially with you know armed feminism, civil rights activism, um, which has all varying levels uh, of understanding. And you certainly see some things being mirrored today, although as a historian, I have to be very careful because history does not repeat itself when you get into the academic sense of that, because you know circumstances are always different. Technologies are different. People are different. So yes, things can follow patterns, but they're not the same. You know, And so you can say that they're similar, but you have to be very careful of saying they're exactly the same. But no, not necessarily. Um, Europe, Guns are pretty commonplace. Uh, by the 1600s, people owned hundreds of guns, which is impressive since they were custom made <laughs> and there was no manufacturing processes. Um, I think change also really happens when people move to cities and crime increases in the 20th century um, and you get modern culture and people start having opinions on that. Um, so a lot of it's a 20th century phenomenon. Um, not that it's saying that it didn't exist, but the 20th century phenomenon really hits hard, um, especially with the strengthening of the federal government. I think, you know, them getting involved uh, in all of the gun laws and tracing crime and all of that changes um, and gives people very strong feelings about it. One of the things that I continually see these days is in countries that have gun bans, we'll say the UK, for example, they're, they're finding increases in knife crime now. And I just saw something two days ago or yesterday about um, uh, Australia is now moving to regulate knives because uh, somebody there was a mass stabbing in a mall or something. Six people got injured or killed, and and I just I scrolled past it, uh, kind of rolled my eyes because I was like, "Yep, violence be violence." But uh, I'm wondering if if violence really always has been present, and if it's just the firearms now make it so much more obvious because they're loud and they're easily accessible, and you can dispense many projectiles as opposed to something else, you know, a mace or a bat, baseball bat or you know, a club or, you know, a, 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 an edged weapon, you know, something like that. Is, is it, is it always, been, has it always been around and is it just more obvious now or, or are things changing? Like what, what's the, what's the, the, the origin of this attempt to control and regulate the, the, the gun in response yeah. to violence? Um, Oh gosh, that is like, do we have Animal. hours? Hey, you're on the um, hot seat. I can't wait to hear this answer. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, violence has always been around. So we can just establish that. Um, but in terms of the firearm specifically, and, I, and actually I'll point out that knife regulations in the United States are crazy complicated and knives are very much regulated in the U.S. And right. that's all I know about that. Um, but people don't necessarily realize that because that's not the talking point. But yeah, it's knife regulations are a huge issue and it's actually some area where gun lobbyists you know transfer over to knife lobbyists and do a lot with you know the inner city because a lot of people get you know arrested for having you know a specific type of knife that they weren't even using for anything so not gonna get into that because i did i didn't even know that was a thing so oh yeah they're right. they're heavily regulated and in certain areas of the country and so that's in its own interesting and if you want to talk about that on a show sometime i know the people but um in terms of firearms regulation um, a lot of the early regulations, when you look at the 1500s, there was an outright um, handgun ban of the Wheelock, which I won't get into what that is, but um, that's really the only feature-based ba feature firearms ban that's, you know, very prevalent until you get to the late 19th century. Um, typically, the fire, the concern there was the distance, the ability to, um, especially when you get handguns, conceal and kill at distance, and, and a lot of that was... Um, 
because the you know royal family's nobility were concerned that they could be assassinated now that you could conceal a handgun in the 1500s and you could also you didn't have to get that close but if you also think about a crossbows and longbows you know did the same um but yeah i think it's the you know the not psychologist in me i think it's the distance uh behind it that plays a really important you know role in that change and then also it becomes less about the regulation of the thing and more about the regulation of the people um, and specifically what I mean by that, and I'll speak about the colonies and into, you know, early America and unfortunately up through like early 1900s America is, you know, it wasn't the gun, it was weapons in general. So it could be a lot of different things. It could be edged weapons, it could be firearms, it could be um, batons, you know, different types of things that were used um, as weapons. And specifically those, it didn't matter what it was, it was to regulate certain people. So in the colonies, if you were a Native American or a free Black, you know, you were not allowed to own firearms. And if you sold firearms to them, you could be sentenced to death. I mean, it was very, very serious. Mm -hmm. um, they took it very seriously. And so when you get into, you know, early America and the 1800s, the, especially when you look at the South um, and you look at states, I mean, the laws are not, you know, they're not, <laughs> they're not difficult to know and, and know what they were trying to do because they're literally like free Blacks, can't own guns or enslaved people's can own guns. Um, and then there are moments where they're like, mm, maybe you can. And then two years later, they're like, never mind. And not only do they say never mind, like they search your homes, like they seize the guns out of your homes. And so it's very much oriented to types of people, uh, classes of people um, are a big part of that. And it doesn't switch to be about the gun specifically and the technology specifically um, until, and I hate to do cause and effect here because I know there's a lot more going on, but the after the Civil War, there's the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which is a federal um, act, um, you know, that basically allows, and the 14th Amendment, which allows, you know, African-Americans to have have, you know, the same rights as other people in theory. Um, and so what happens in the South is that there are the black codes, which, you know, are obviously problematic, but what happens when they ban it, when they make it so that you can't say black people can't own guns, all of a sudden you get what's called army navy laws uh, which are like early saturday night special laws where it's now the gun and you know cheaper guns you know those are dangerous and so you know you can only own these specific models which also happen to be very expensive which limit a whole class of people um, not just a race but a whole class of people and that kind of continues to develop to be the firearm the features which leads up to the federal you know national firearms act but it becomes about the gun uh, when it can't be about the people. And I think that that probably contributed significantly to the demonization of the firearm uh, because, you know, now the government's saying these certain things are what's causing, you know, problems in crime and, you know, organized crime, obviously, in the prohibition era is something people are very scared of. And so when you make it about the gun, it becomes something that people are more aware of and more concerned about. And this is where the roots of the uh, the talking point that all gun control is racist seems to stem is that if you have your origins in these laws that were specifically written that with that language, and then later the language was removed because like, well, we can't say that anymore, but well, what we want the same effect right now, we're talking about something that's very popular these days, which is, you know, systemic racism, right? But we, we're not, I don't think we're paying enough attention to systemic racism in certain uh, targeted uh, industries, if you will, and firearms being one of those. But if you're going to restrict something that is uniquely challenging to obtain to a certain demographic, you essentially create the same result. Am, am I close on that? Yeah, um, you, you are close on that. And the other part about it, too, which is frustrating, is the fact that when you look at the historical origins of a lot of these things creating this, you know, systemic problem um you know in american culture it then gets picked up by pro-gun people or you know anti-gun people or pro-gun control um uh, people and they turn it into rhetoric and when it becomes rhetoric it all of a sudden becomes not real uh to the other side and so you know mastery or mastery from black guns matter i mean he's the one with the shirt all gun control is racist um you know and i read an article recently in you know a, a non-gun publication that basically said well now the republicans are you know, saying it's, you know, it's about racism and, you know, they think it's this new thing and that because, you know, the NRA said it or because the NSSF said it or because a pro-gun organization said it, then now it, it's not true. And, you know, and same on the other side. And so I think it's really interesting
interesting how, you know, just because it's rhetoric doesn't mean it's not true. But then also because you know the rhetoric doesn't mean you know the whole story. Yeah, it's uh, it becomes ad hominem, right? So because so and so published it, then it's discredited. And we're seeing this now with COVID too, and you know, studies of all sorts of things. You know, it's like, well, it came from that person. I've already decided my label is going to go on that person. Therefore, anything that person generates is dismissed. And yeah. that's super dangerous because now we're dismissing people like yourself because, you know, you're you're a scientist. Historians are scientists as far as I'm concerned because they're <laughs> mostly agnostic right. in their publication and their research and uh, and their testimonies. And yet, if if I've decided in your mind that you're a pro-2A person, then it doesn't matter what comes out of your mouth after that. Which, by the way, for anybody listening, if you've ever heard me say that verbal resumes are not my thing, <laughs> that's why. Because <laughs> I don't want to be put into a box. I, I believe that the information that comes out of my mouth in a given presentation or a, or a, a seminar needs to stand on its own. Because I think if it's true, truth resonates with people regardless of the vessel delivering it. Um, but it, it, it's, something, it's something I want the listening audience to be mindful of is, if you feel yourself start to become defensive based on the the deliverer of the content, you might want to check and make sure that that that's not a you issue, right? That you're you're not just simply categorizing this person and making an ad hominem dismissal of the information. That could be very dangerous. Yeah, the interesting part about the whole because I've been in the firearms industry for so long, and I I remember when I first got into the industry, you know, I was like a kind of kid coming from the city going into this new world where there was a lot of hunters and, and people like that that had grown up around firearms and being around the shows, there wasn't a lot of black faces. It's a lot of older white people. I always used to joke around. I said, this is like, if you didn't have the label on it, you'd be like, yeah. I'm at a gay older gentleman's convention <laughs> <laughs> because it was all dudes, right? <laughs> and they were all white. So, you know, I think about it like, uh, you, you know, it, before I was married, I was dating a girl who was black. She she hated the NRA. She hate you know she hated the Second Amendment crowd because she she just put that label on there. And I remember one day, she kept saying, "Come on, Mike, like look around your thing." And I couldn't argue that, right? I couldn't argue that. Yeah, I mean, it look it looks like a lot of older white people. Um, but the problem with it is is that that carried over, and now some of the same people that made those decisions back then to say like, "I've already put these people in a box." They're like, oh, how convenient. You're like all gun control is racist. Look yeah. at yourselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I do understand where it comes from, where the other side goes, come on. Like, you're just saying that you're really racist, right? Like, you you know, the, it, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of people that are said like, okay, I'm going to attend an NRA show now and, and you know, try to understand. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and the problem too is that I feel like the gun industry doesn't, or hasn't historically done a great job at making you know, different people, people of color, different you know, belief systems, women always think they've done a pretty poor job of making people feel welcome, especially people with different belief systems. And so I know lots of liberal gun owners, you know, I, when I started studying guns, I was a registered Democrat um, because I don't see guns as a political, it doesn't need to be political, but both sides need it to be political, <laughs> you know? So I think sometimes I joke, if we could ultimately solve the, the issue, you know, nobody would go for it on either side because then there wouldn't be the fear or the money. Um, but I know those people exist. They just don't feel like they have a home, you know, to be able to come forward and say, you know, I believe in this and I'm also a gun owner because they get destroyed um, by gun people. And so it is interesting because, yeah, those are the faces you see, but they're not the only people. They just don't feel comfortable uh, to come forward and to talk about it. Uh, you know, and I, there are times that I, you know, I'm uncomfortable to come forward and talk about it, um, you know, certain things in my life because I'm worried that people will put me into a box that, you know, I, I can't control. Um, and I guess the, the, the most recent one that Jake and I talked about is the fact that I have bipolar two disorder. Um, and I, I think the reason that I really, I had questions, you know, I sent an email one night with all these questions about mental illness is because uh, one of the times I made a post about my expert witness testimony and somebody commented and was like, oh my God, thanks so much for everything that you do. You're truly, you know, the best two-way advocate ever. And if we could just keep guns out of crazy people's hands, then, you know, we'd be fine. And I'm like, well, ironically, or maybe coincidentally, I never know <laughs> which one's which, you know, I'm quote unquote, a crazy person. And you just thanked me for helping your 2A rights, you know, and you didn't see me as a threat. And so, you know, that's, I think my, been my biggest concern recently is that 
I think there's a lot of people that suffer from a lot of things and the industry tries so hard to say that we, you know, we're there for you and we, you know, we want you to be able to reach out to us, but, you know, no matter who you are, what you are, what you believe, somehow we don't feel welcome even when people pay it lip service. Speaking of monolithic, um, glad you brought that up because that's what we've struggled with as an organization is that we've got these two, you know, we call them sides, but they're really not, but they're two monolithic projections of what people think that they are. And then they, they hold them in that, in that, uh, I guess, uh, that zone. And then it makes it really hard to have dialogue. And I can say, you know, there's number 47 episode that we've done here. I think every single person that's come on has struggled with a mental illness of some sort, whether it's effectively diagnosed and under treatment or has undergone treatment and recovered or is ongoing, including the two hosts, um, we've, we've struggled with mental illness, you know? So if you're going to cast a wide net, um, you better be careful about where you're throwing it because you're going to end up capturing people who you will wind up changing your mind. You will either change your mind and integrate that new information in, or you're going to reject it wholesale and burrow yourself further into your own, um, you know, strictly drawn rigidity around your, your ideology and your beliefs. And that's, and that's super dangerous because then we just get more people pulling to the polar ends of things and less, you know, fewer people in the center. It is irony, by the way, uh, you did use Thank that. You. <laughs> yeah. I get so confused on that one. Share, share a little bit because you know, we've had lots of people on the show who have shared their own struggles and their own um, uh, triumphs. How has how's this been for you now that you're you know officially out of the closet? Like I had to come out of the closet to my own community of professional clinicians who are equally judgy about gun owners in many ways. How has it been for you uh, in you know encountering that, integrating it in, navigating the the, the tides, I suppose? Yeah, well, it's been it's been interesting for me because I have a service dog as well. Um, so I very visually have, you know, someone that helps me. Um, and people, I think people are really funny because they ask you things that like you would never ask somebody else. Like I get asked what's wrong with me constantly. <laughs> um, my answer is always, you you don't have time. Um, but you know, what's interesting is, is that Firstly, I don't always talk about it because I don't always talk about the fact that I have arthritis or the fact that I was in a wheelchair for, you know, a little bit in middle school and then I've had all these surgeries. Well, you it's know, not so your identity, you know, it's yeah. not your identity. It's something you deal with, but it's not who you are at your core and it doesn't pervade everything that you do. Yeah. And the, the other part about it is, you know, and it's been, it's relatively recent diagnosis uh, last November, I think, you know, because before it was, I had depression um, and I, and I do suffer from PTSD, but, uh, I didn't know about the fact that I did not have depression until they gave me antidepressants, which if you have bipolar disorder one or two, um, that's real bad. That, <laughs> that can be really a recipe for a disaster. So when they gave me, um, antidepressants and up the level, cause I was originally on antidepressants for chronic pain too. Um, and when they increased the level, you know, I had a really bad fallout from that. And that was when my psychiatrist, you know, gave me a little thing to fill out. And when I realized what the, what the survey was for, I started lying on, on it, um, uh, because, you know, there's such a stigma about bipolar disorder and, you know, and people think that all bipolar is bipolar one, which is the one, the traditional version, which, which has the, the full mania involved in it. But even people don't understand that that's not something that's constantly happening. You know, it happens maybe once a year. Uh, it's not a regular occurrence. And then the people with bipolar two, we're much more, we don't have mania, we have hypomania, um, which most people just associate with passion. And if you met anybody that knows me, that's usually how I get uh, categorized. Um, and it's more marked by the depression. And so I knew the stigma. I didn't want that diagnosis. So I lied. And then, you know, I went, I went uh, up to our cabin for Thanksgiving and was like, I should probably call my psychiatrist because now that I think about it, there's probably no better, there's probably no better a diagnosis for my personality. You know, we, it's just the thing about bipolar two is that people don't, people often don't know that you have it uh, because of the whole passion thing, you know, and, and I look back at uh, a period during the renovation because I was in charge of everything with the renovation, fundraising content. Uh, and in the middle of the renovation, I also filmed an entire TV show. I was gone for six weeks, filmed it, you know, had a full work week, then worked another 40 hours um, so that I could get my work done. And you look back and you're like, oh yeah, 
<laughs> I feel like that makes the most sense on the planet uh, that I was able to kind of keep going. And I, I crashed really hard after that. And we didn't know what it was. You know, I just thought I was, you know, overly tired. Um, and it, it just was one of those things where I saw my passion as this great strength. And I still think that, you know, it is a great strength for me. But now I have to recognize that sometimes I need to be able to turn it off in order to not crash behind closed doors, because that's usually when it happens, you know, the, the hypomania feels great uh, until it doesn't. And so I, that's part of what my service dog does is actually he starts whacking me <laughs> if I get too, if I'm looking like I'm, I'm getting too hyped up because he knows that that will result in a crash and burn. And so I'm happy. I know what it is and make, you know, it's nice to be able to you know have an answer to it. And then it also helps me manage it so that I can, you know, have the hypomania and, and utilize it to my best ability to get work done, to be able to be very efficient, but then also be able to stop it in a way that doesn't cause harm, you know, ultimately to my mental health and everything else in my life. I, I, um, I need to do a video on the, the types of bipolar disorders, because there's a lot of confusion about that. But, you know, hypomania standing on its own is is usually regarded as a good thing. And sometimes it can be regarded as a, a bad thing, especially if you get your fa your flames fanned by people around you cheering you on to, to tackle all these these things that, you know, sound cartoonish when you start listing them off. And certainly there are people out there who are very passionate again many people who have been on the show fall into the hypomanic category when they're just go 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 it but it's the corresponding depression that's really the problem right and yeah. and what i say a lot of the time is we want to try to do what you've done which is harness it direct it master it and control it so it's not in charge of you you're in charge of it and then it can turn into quite the blessing as it turns out when you can navigate life by using this tremendous superpower that I think that that you have that many of us have and direct that aspirational energy into quality products and great outcomes like renovating the freaking Smithsonian you know what I mean like like that's a big deal and not too many people can pull it off unless you have this like thing that you're not aware of you're like oh by the way that was a that was a mental illness that powered me through that <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe they're not all bad <laughs> right that, that's true you know and and the other thing that I you know found interesting kind of dealing with a lot of the mental illness over the years and especially you know the PTSD um is that for you know everyone's experience with depression and you know firearms is very different and i know this is what you guys focus and um but even at my lowest moments you know having firearms in the house for me that wasn't you know there wasn't a concern it wasn't like oh because i have a firearm you know now it's just so much easier for me i mean it's when you have those dark thoughts you know for me it's you know other things you know it's never been the firearm and i know that's not the case for everyone but i think everyone blankets that if you are depressed if you have suicidal thoughts if you have any of these ideations that oh my god we have to get all the guns out of the house and that might be the case for some people but that might you know it's not necessarily a, a band-aid to fix everyone um and it might not stop everyone and i just think the complicated nature of that, which is not, you know, my area of expertise, it's all anecdotal based on my personal, you know, life, um, is that, you know, it's, it's so much more complicated than that, you know, I, know I just said that, um, but then there is a fear of telling anybody about it, I mean, this is the first time I'm speaking publicly about having bipolar too, and, you know, I asked my husband, I said, is there, are there going to be repercussions in his career, you know, in my career, if people know that, and that, you know, it's not just, I, I worry about gun people, you know, think, you Know, saying nasty things, but then you also worry about people outside the gun community saying, well, then you shouldn't own a firearm, you know, and it's like you almost get ganged up. You're worried about getting ganged up upon by, by everybody. Um, and it shouldn't have to be that way. Uh, I think there was a John Korea who has act active self-protection uh, made a post that I thought was really interesting during the whole Simone Biles thing, um, which was basically like, hey, uh, you know, what you're saying about someone who's famous, that famous person isn't going to see it. Um, but what you're saying may hit home for someone you do know and care about, and that's the person it's going to impact. And I thought that was, I think there was a meme going around about the same thing. And I just thought that was so, um, fascinating because there is this whole, you know, we're here for you. We support you. And then we talk shit about other people that actually may have the same thing that you do. It's very complicated and stressful. It's just, yeah, but you'd be, you know, you'd be surprised that, that, you know, and thank you for, for coming out and doing this and fighting in the open on the show i mean that's that's awesome um but you'd be surprised like this is what we need 
we need this as the firearms community because we we need to be able to stand up and be like, hey, just because we own firearms doesn't mean that we don't get bogged down with daily life and things don't go on in our head. And you can't take it away from us. Just you can't use that excuse. You know what I mean? And I think mm-hmm. once the 2A community, just like they figured out that gun control is racist, right? Like once they figure out like the more that we step forward and like, no, that's not right. Just because I battle bipolar disorder doesn't mean that you get to take away something from me or use it against me. Yeah. Right? And that's that's the most important thing. So I'm very proud of you right now. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, and I think for me, the most frustrating thing, and I sent you guys that email, was that you know, I read an article by NAMI that with the National Association of Mental Illness about uh, mental illness and I think mass shooters. And, you know, it was breaking down kind of, you know, the idea that people with mental illness can be violent, but that it's not this, you know, not everybody is violent. But then, and, and the article was, you know, really resonated until it got to the part of how to acquire a firearm. And it was just, you know, they blamed, you know, the gun, <laughs> just like gun people blame people with mental illness. And so I wanted to get involved with you guys because I'm like, you know, you've got half of the, you know, the mental health community who's like really spot on, really spot on, really spot on. Then they hit a wall of ignorance with understanding firearms and acquisition of firearms and all that. And then all of a sudden it doesn't discredit their knowledge because they're so wrong here and vice versa with the gun community and mental illness. And so I agree. I think people do need to talk about it more so that they can start to recognize that the person next to you is probably dealing with something and that's totally okay. And it doesn't mean that you have to act now, you know, in order to save the greater community yeah i think there's two prongs there that really stand out to me one is it's it's a me too movement uh so that the broader firearms community go yeah yeah i've I've, I've dealt with that too and i also don't want to be lumped into the category of uh, dangerous people uh because you're not and then the other prong is this idea that um we when we're when we're moving through the me too uh, it goes both ways right when i came out as a firearms owning clinician and we started doing these cultural competence courses it was amazing how many other clinicians also joined in and said yeah yeah i also own guns and but they're still whispering about it right it would be nice if we if we announced it loudly but then when we do to mike's point about the the racism behind the laws we have to acknowledge we were wrong before and, and I think that's where we get lost in the talking points and the mimetic conversations and the, and the rhetoric is that what gets lost is the ability to acknowledge that people evolve and say, I mean, I'm in a profession where we, we hang our hat on the idea that people can grow and evolve and change and recover. And if it doesn't do anybody any good to lock them into some, some rigid structure, right? Again, the box and the label, because then it's really hard to let them out. And so we, when we say that, we have to go, yeah, I was wrong about this. And one of the things I've been wrong about recently that I've said forever and ever and ever, because I, I find hope in it, is people can recover from mental illness. It's, it's in the tagline in the intro when I say, you know, they can recover. It's not, you know, struggle in perpetuity. What I'm realizing, though, is that I have to change my mind about the idea that some people's uh, version of recovery is management, right? It's not that it goes away. And and I I think for far too long, I held on to that belief that it was like, Oh, whatever your deal, your anxiety. I know lots of people actually now I've had some really intimate conversations with people who struggle with anxiety. And they're like, my anxiety is under control. It's never going to go away. And I go, yeah. And then I have to shut up and listen to them because what they, what they're saying to me is it's not, it's not hitting diagnostic criteria of a, of a life altering problem. Right. It's yeah, it's still there. I just learned to, to attenuate it, ch- turn it up when I need it. You know, if I, if I need to get motivated to, you know, clean the house or study for a test or something. That's when anxiety is really, really beneficial. And if you know, you just kind of have that, you can use it. Uh, Bruce Banner does it in the, in the character for the Hulk. And he's like, I'm always angry. I've just learned to like channel it when it's necessary. And I think that's beautiful. Um, So I'm learning to change my mind. If the firearms community can learn to change its mind about, you know, struggling with mental illness and say, I was wrong to put this in a monolithic category if the if the mental health community can change its mind and go you know maybe we were wrong about what gun culture represents and maybe universally applicable policy de- decisions aren't the right idea which is really what it comes down to is these policies aren't very good because they're not well thought through because they're blanket and they don't allow for exceptions frequently then maybe we can all start to move a little more toward the center and have reasonable logical rational conversations about how to solve problems like suicide and violence and access during times of crisis because the same recipe isn't going to work for everybody as you just pointed out 
Yeah. Well, and that just made me think about something in terms of rhetoric within the gun community. And I, I know, Mike, you were just talking about this uh, at some uh, you know, event, um, is the fact that when you think about it, you know, the gun community is so against red flag laws. Um, you know, but the only thing you really hear, with the exception of you guys, and maybe you know more people that talk about it, but when I hear red flag laws, all I know is domestic violence situations and domestic abuse situations, which obviously is a very important thing to talk about. But I feel like I don't hear the damage that red flag laws can do for, you know, someone with mental illness. Uh, when I was in undergrad or grad school, I went to a symposium on mental illness and firearms. And the person from the state, you know, it said there was almost a law passed where if you were committed to a mental institution for three days, um, then you lost all your firearms. They come, they take them. Um, and the thing was that in the state of Delaware, you could be in, you could be involuntarily committed for three days. And you could leave, you know, and be fine. But even if you were fine, um, you know, you still have to wait those three days. You know, so it's it's something that would impact people that they didn't think about. But I feel like I don't hear that it could also protect people with mental illness from getting kind of categorized by somebody in the gun community, outside the gun community, who thinks you shouldn't have them. I always hear the domestic violence part of it. That's uh, Mike's scarlet letter uh, analogy that he frequently mentions you can share that it's your thing i don't have to steal it from you <laughs> come on man you I, you know i always defer to you in the english language and presentation and <laughs> no but I, I i you know for me i've always felt like if you go get help and we, we see this with like the new york safe act right like it's not so safe because what happens is people don't want to go get help because they're going to end up with that scarlet letter on their yeah. chest coming out of there and sometimes they don't even know it's happening that's the scary part right because they're just like i just went in because i i was feeling down and i didn't realize like it was gonna cost yeah, me San my gun. sandy sandy richardson was on yeah. the podcast talked about that yeah so it's uh you know we have to look at it as a whole because i and and part of me thinks that sometimes when the the um the anti-gun side looks at a red flag law and i do some work with some organizations where there are some anti-people on in the group and I, I truly do think sometimes they they think they're coming from the best place like they 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 yeah. you know, i don't automatically assume they're just like this evil politician right like they're just like this is what makes sense to me but they don't realize like what's happening like they don't, you know what I mean? They're not looking like down the field. They're looking like mm -hmm. three yards ahead going, okay, like, you know, we're going to just get the guns out and then we're going to just screw this person's life up, but we think we're doing good. Yeah. Um, and they just don't realize like what, what's coming from that. So it's just, it's a shame, but I think this is what this is all about, right? Like this, what we're doing here, these, this conversation we're having, the organization as a whole, like, you know, that's what's great about it is not going into it being like, I'm just going to yell pry from a cold dead hands and be a jerk unless like you totally agree with me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, we're, we're getting the conversations. We're, we're, we're able to point that out. You know, I, I, I look at a moment where I was able to point out something to uh, someone from, from Giffords one day. And, uh, and I, did, I was able to do it publicly in a nice way, but yeah. you know, I was like, Hey, did you ever think about this? And that this might da 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 da. And then somebody from another group chimed in uh, it was actually Sherry Moloch, Jake. It was like, Mike makes a really good point when you, <laughs> right? Like, here's a person who's like gun neutral. Um, but I, I think that that's what, we, that's what we need to do to get this cultural shift. You know, that's the direction we want to go. So we're uh, coming up on time and I know Mike's got to take off, but I, I wanted to touch on something real quick that I, my ears perked up to when you mentioned it was about controlling certain sets of people these days on social media the, the commentary is rife with uh they're trying to control us they versus us right this is us versus them thing and it's again government has become monolithic we forget that there's individuals behind this stuff and what is what is your study of history and the the control put that in air quotes for the listening audience is not watching on youtube the control of people, what is what is the end game there, do you think? I mean, you, you've seen this over hundreds of years that you've studied this stuff, and there's always this thematic element of control. Why not trust uh, the people? Are the people just untrustworthy or like, do we need control? Like America was founded on this idea of like, we don't want to, we want to control ourselves. We'll elect our own government. Um, and now it seems to be the, the pendulum is swinging back to this 
if you listen to some of the more extreme positions, like we're returning to Nazi Germany or Stalin's, you know, second coming or you know, something like that. And, and I don't know what to make of that in a, in a broader lens because we're so bottlenecked on, and in tunnel visioned on what we see in our, our crafted news feeds, you know, like, like, is this really new or is it, is it always just kind of been there? And this is the newest iteration. I don't know if I have an answer for <laughs> And that's for our that. show. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, when you render the historian speechless. Um, no, I feel like that is a question better answered by someone who's a psychologist who knows and understands people because historically speaking, we've always tried to control other people, um, it, you know, it, whether it's conquering, you know, in a military sense or a civilian population or, you know, people in your lives. Um, it's always been there. And I mean, I could, from a non-psychology background, be like, because people want to control things that make them, you know, that make them nervous, you know, right. they want to be able to have that control. Um, but again, that's not, that's not history. You know, history is just, yeah, it exists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and these are the different ways that it exists, but I, I don't know why. And I don't know if there's an end game or if anyone goes into it thinking there's an end game. Yeah. I don't know for, for my, and again, disclaimer, I'm not a psychologist, I'm an emergent family therapist, but trade. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just, I, and that's me making assumptions in boxes about what a psychologist nobody is. Nobody knows what we are anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, from that perspective, I, I think you're spot on. We like, we like to control things that make us nervous. It's a fear-based uh, re reflexive response. If we can gain control of the thing that's scary, uh, then we believe we've created a sense of safety. So whether I wear a gun or a mask, I'm, I'm protecting myself against something I perceive as dangerous. So fear's roots is in, in a danger or threat, usually to physical, you know, well-being, but sometimes it's ideological too. And in the case of like totalitarianism, that's ideological. You can't really put your finger on it most times. And so I guess, you know, if somebody's in power, even if they're elected in power, what's the next step? Get reelected, right? How do you do that? You control the messaging, you control the narrative, you tell tell people that you did some good for the for your constituents, send me back into office, right? So retain that sense of power and um, you know, by the way, don't look at the things that I voted on that you didn't like. <laughs> so we'll try to control the, you know, the, the impression that way. So I get it. It makes sense. Um, it was just more of my, my curiosity than anything. I, I don't know if it's necessarily more pernicious now than it ever has been. I think it's just more amplified through all the 24 hour news cycles and all the great technology we have at our fingertips to give us this information. And then because we've slapped so many labels on things, uh, and it feeds our confirmation bias. And so do the, the news feeds that are crafted for us based on our likes and, and thumbs ups and all that stuff. It tends to create this feedback loop of like, yeah, yeah, the world's collapsing around you. <laughs> like, yeah. well, maybe it isn't. Well, and it's almost like it's always been around, but maybe it's more diversified. Uh, because when you look at, you know, England with monarchy, uh, you know, they made the call and they did the control and people's lives were very, you know, structured and stratified. And so if you were, um, you know, a, a serf and other kind of, you know, in other civilizations and, and that kind of thing, I mean, you didn't really have any of that control or the ability to, to make that decision. And now I feel like everybody feels like they've got the ability to control, you know, even with social media, cancel culture. I mean, I, like anyone feels like they can control, uh, you know, the outcome of someone and then they grab mob mentality and you got a whole host of, <laughs> you got a whole host of psychological things to evaluate there. Um, so maybe it's just more diversified or feels more diversified uh, because people have more autonomy than they have in the past and their ability to speak their mind more than they have historically speaking. Yeah. And even if it's not legitimized through um, documents, right. And through, through, uh, through seminal documents and, and, lit and, um, and uh, doctrine, they have the appearance of it because now we've created this plat, these platforms, these many platforms where previously somebody wasn't allowed to opine to hundreds or uh, thousands or even millions, what their belief systems are to see that threatened now threatens that perception of autonomy perception of of freedom and they don't want to lose that once you've gained it so yeah, that makes sense yeah um i want to i want to honor everybody's time though and mike's always got to close with this question so uh i gotta ask you what we ask every guest <laughs> ashley thank you for, <laughs> thank you for coming I, I i wanted to let you know something you want a dog a puppy and uh after the show get <laughs> <laughs> 
and keep it really uh, preoccupied, as you say. No, no. <laughs> you could pick one of three. There's a gray one. There's a champagne color. And there's... <laughs> so uh, the question will be is, what is your address? And when will you be home to take the dog? Now, uh, <laughs> it's a joke, by the way, that nobody's in on is that no, Mike no. has three puppies. <laughs> And they are destroying his house, like literally the drywall, the staircase, like holes in walls. They are eating their way out like Shawshank. They are. Oh digging, <laughs> digging one, one spoonful at a time goes into the courtyard. Yeah. Yeah. If they weren't so damn cute, they would be gone. Is one but... of them named Andy Dufresne. <laughs> you know, uh, that could be one thing we could do, though, is just get progressively gets worse as you come on the show you get a puppy you don't know yeah it. but uh <laughs> it's a kid it comes with a kid is that better or worse for your mental health i don't know <laughs> <laughs> well no seriously uh thank you thank you for coming on and, and being vulnerable and 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 fighting in the open and i think this is awesome and i can't wait to work with you in the future um how how do you tend to your mental health you gave us a couple uh peeks into that you're talking about the service dog and everything like that but how do you tend to your mental health these days um, so I do balance between medication and therapy. So I, I am on an anticonvulsant for the uh, bipolar two. <laughs> I just got distracted. Sorry. Uh, I'm on a I'm on <laughs> I'm on an anticonvulsant for the bipolar two for the PTSD. I'm actually not on anything other than I'm on a blood pressure medicine that's used for PTSD nightmares. And then I do a therapy. I did a therapy called EMDR for a while, but it wasn't a good fit for me. So I do what's called somatic experiencing, um, which also has a lot of ties into chronic pain, which is something that I've suffered from since I was a kid. Um, so I do therapy, that type of uh, somatic experiencing medication. And then I don't, I would prefer if possible, I feel very privileged if I can use that word to not have to be on mood stabilizers. I would rather not be on mood stabilizers. And so that's where the service dog comes in. Um, and for me, I'm just trying to ground as much as possible to try to be able to pick up on any type of issue before it gets out of control. But it's definitely a combination of meds and therapy and dog love. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm so glad you, you talked about the medication because that's another thing in the 2A community that we have to knock off. It's like, we just want to just blame meds for everything. And we have to be careful not to stigmatize those that take medication and it works perfectly fine because there's millions of people out there that do. Right. Yeah. And, and that's important too. So I think, I think you representing a, a good balance of, of solutions and variables, you said that you've tried some, they don't work. Then <laughs> you find the ones that do. Right. And you find the ones that are best for you. Well, and if I may, um, just real quick, uh, the thing with the service dog that I, I actually talked about this on Cheryl's show is they can be an amazing benefit for a whole host of things. He's great for my PTSD. He's getting better for my bipolar too. But the reality, and, I, and it's like meds aren't good for everyone. Therapies not, you know, some therapies aren't good for everybody, but the recognition that a service dog is a ton of work and it's like taking a toddler with you uh, everywhere. And so right now my service dog is really providing me a lot of help, but it's definitely something that I think people can consider, but they should also consider just the, the commitment that's involved in that. It's kind of like the commitment of a puppy. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see how your service dog takes to the new puppy. They're right, he does not <laughs> like puppies, so I don't think it'll go well. <laughs> the new puppy doesn't like uh, infrastructure, as it turns out, so uh, yeah. <laughs> before long, you won't even have a home. Well, uh, how, can, how can people reach you? You mentioned social media a couple of times. Yeah, so on Instagram, I'm at History and Heels. And on Facebook, I'm at Official Ashley Levinsky, which have fun spelling that. Uh, I have a Twitter account, but I don't use it because that's like, is toxic, but I'd rather someone not steal my name for it. Uh, and then if you have any questions, you can go to my website, theguncode.com. Uh, you can find anything about my consulting. If you are a museum or someone who wants to hire my services, please reach out to me through the website. I don't know if we have any museums that subscribe, but if I ever hear of one that does, I will be uh, shocked because I didn't know they had ears, uh, but I will let you know. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It's been awesome. I can't wait to continue working with you in the future. Uh, there's a lot to learn. I love, I love history. I love digging, digging into it. I love that you got to share your experience and hopefully again, it, it's an invitation to other people to, do the same thing. And maybe we can all just continue moving toward, you know, getting along instead of fragmenting and, and fighting all the time. Cause it's getting old. It's exhausting. Too much cortisol pumping through our brains. 
Um, to our listening audience, we appreciate you. Please share this around. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a rating and review. That's always helpful, or so they tell me. And if you want to donate, we welcome you to donate. WTTA.org. Our title sponsor for the show is Arms Corps. They have been fantastic since the beginning. Uh, if you want to knock off Arms Corps as our title sponsor, we would also welcome you and your money, and then we can get into a bidding war with Arms Corps. That might be fun. Um, just kidding, Dustin, if you're listening. But uh, on behalf of all of our people, the Zephyr Wellness family, the Walk the Talk America family, and anybody who's interested in this topic, we thank you very much. We wish you all great mental health. Take care.